let's see. Okay, I think we are live, yes. So hello everyone and welcome to another session of the Latin American webinars on physics. I'm Joel Jones from the PUCP in Peru and I will be your host today. Um, this is webinar number 143 and we're having Miguel Romao as a speaker. Miguel did his PhD at the University of Southampton in UK, which was followed by a brief postdoc at the same university. He, he then abandoned us for a couple of years working as a data scientist and machine learning engineer at a startup in Cardiff. But fortunately for us, he came back to academia as a postdoc at LIP in Portugal. Uh, he's currently back in Southampton as a visiting researcher and also working part-time as a data scientists in industry. So if you think that you were busy, think again. <laughs> uh, Miguel will join uh, Durham University as a postdoc in October. And today he will tell us about artificial intelligence and machine learning applied to particle physics. We are very happy to have him as a speaker. And uh, well, before we begin, as usual, let me remind all viewers that you can ask questions and uh, make comments via the YouTube live chat system. And these questions will be passed on to Miguel at the end of his talk. Okay, so Miguel, if you could please share your screen. You're so ready to go. All right, so thank you very much for the nice uh, introduction. And indeed, I'm going to be talking today about artificial intelligence and machine learning for colliding building standard model physics. So this is the very rough outline. I'm going to start with a very brief introduction of machine learning and its context in HEP. And then I'm going to move to two lines of research that I've been conducting, one for collider physics with a very specific focus on jet quenching. Uh, by the quark one plasma, and then the other one, which is closer to my heart, and something that I am more quite keen on progressing, which is to use machine learning and AI for BSM model building, namely applied to parameter space scans. So machine learning in HEP, and before we start with machine learning in HEP, let's talk about what is machine learning and artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is the quest of creating machines that think and act intelligently. And in his seminal paper, Alan Turing very, um, very quickly realized uh, that a machine, in order to exhibit some type of artificial intelligence, some type of intelligence, has to learn from experience. So in his seminal paper, Computational Machinery and Intelligence, you have seven sections, and there's seven sections about learning. So machine learning is then a subfield of AI that concerns itself on how the machine can learn from experience or the way that we see it in a more pragmatic way, how a machine can learn how to perform tasks. So the most, I think that the most intuitive way of thinking about it is to think about machine learning as a different type of programming, nothing more. So in classical programming, what you would have would be a programmer that would input rules into the code. So you write code and you compile it and you have a, a, then a binary that will process inputs, which would be data to give you answers. So this is what classical programming is. You input the rules, you create a program and the program will transform inputs into answers, into outputs. In machine learning, you have a different paradigm of computing. You already have a lot of data, which has the answers and you don't know what are the rules that produce the answers that you're seeing in the data. So for example, this can be labels of pictures, this can be what type of labeled data you, you might have lying around. So what you do is you develop a machine learning algorithm that will try to derive the rules from the data. And once it has produced the rules, it is equivalent of being compiled. You then have a new program that will be able to process new data to produce answers. So machine learning is a Classic, it's a different paradigm of programming where the rules are not imputed by the user, but are found out by the machine. Now, it is very important to understand uh, the current scope and capacity of machine learning. So the current paradigm of learning is that of statistical learning. So this means that machines can learn functions over the distributions of the data. What does this mean? Is that your data by definition is finite and by being finite, it will have a compact support over the, the variables. And therefore the only things, the only functions that the machine will be able to learn will be within these bounds, with the compact support of your data. 
As a result, machine learning algorithms tend to be incredible interpolators and not so good extrapolators. Another feature or bug is that the current paradigm of learning requires large amounts of data, far more than what a biological intelligence needs. Up to some discussion of that subject. In HEP, there has been a huge resurgence of interest in machine learning and AI applications. And I'm not going to review all of it. It is virtually impossible. Thankfully for us, for the last three, four years that this resurgence has happened, someone has decided to create a living review that tries to collect the references into topical organization. And so if you are interested in a specific topic, you can go to this website, you can click control or command F to use a keyword of something that you're working on. And chances are that someone has already done a paper on that subject. Obviously, it might not have done your idea, but it is a very good way of doing a very quick review. So I'm not going to cover everything that the community is doing. Obviously, I can still self-promote my work. So apart from what I'm going to be talking today, I've also been working very closely with experimentalists, namely in their artist collaboration on how to develop machine learning algorithms that could be generic discriminants for new physics. So things that would not be trained on specific signal hypothesis. Also playing around with them with clustering of collider events, but, and I am a PI for a project on quantum machine learning in HAP. So apart from AI and machine learning, you also have noticed that another technology that is gaining a bit of interest, both in the industry and in academia, is that of quantum computing. And so quantum machine learning is nothing else than just performing machine learning tasks on a quantum device. And there is a paper that we put out and is a, a project that we have running. Now I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that I've been doing more recently. And I'm actually going to start with our first work on the, on the matter. And then I'm going to progress to our most recent one and something that we have uh, in the oven. So I'm going to talk about the st collider studies for jet quenching. So first of all, what is jet quenching? When you have heavy ion collisions, at really high energy, so relativistic heavy ions, you can, for a very, very brief moment in time, create something which is the quark one plasma. So the quark one plasma, it's a very, it's, it's a colorful state of matter, very hot and dense, where quarks and gluons are actually free. And so they are, they are the relevant degrees of freedom. So it is like a plasma. So this has been first observed at the relativistic heavy ion collider, but now as well as the LHC. During the brief time that the plasma exists, jets, which will be then produced by hard scattering processes within the plasma, will have to traverse the plasma for a short period of time. This will then lead to jet quenching, which is the modification of jets by the quark one plasma. So therefore, jets can be used as probes to the quark one plasma. So you can imagine, or you can think about this as using the LHC as a microscope to the quark one plasma, where the jets is what the microscope is picking up. So obviously this is difficult because first, so here we have two heavy ions colliding by, by themselves on the side view. So this is a side view. So they look like pancakes because of Lorentz contraction, right? But if you see like along the beam line, then you have quark one plasma generating and some, some hard scatter points from nucleons were going to create jets. Then eventually the quark one plasma starts to cool down and the dronization starts to take place. And in the end of the day, you only have hadrons and hadrons will then be the jets that will uh, deposit uh, signals in your collider. So it is very important in order to study the quark one plasma colliders to be able to isolate the jets that will modify it by the quark one plasma. Now, it is important to understand that not all quenching or not all interactions between the jet and the quark one plasma is made equal. So as the jets traverse the quark one plasma, there's going to be for momentum and color change with the medium. And so at very early stages, the parton shower is going to be, uh, it's going to be changed. So it's, uh, it's going to be modified. So later stages of the jet in principle will have imprinted in them the changes to the early history of the jet. So the very intuitive vision that you normally have for hard scatters in proton-proton, just like in this picture, breaks down because what you have is something more on the right-hand side, which is you have a part and part colliding and then some jets will then traverse large amounts or longer periods of time inside the quark plasma and others will not. But you can also have jets that will traverse just on the on the rim, some on the center, and etc. So you have this capacity of using jets, quench jets, as a multi-scale probe 
to for the quark one plasma because all of these modifications are not going to be equal. So some of the jets, even at heavy angles, will be very vacuum-like, so they will not interact with the quark one plasma. Some will interact a bit, some will interact a lot. So you don't have a discrete binary yes or no has it interacted. What you have is vacuum-like jets and some that were then um, interacts with different amounts. And what do we actually have at experiments? Experimentalists only, can only see jets. So you have here two, two event reconstructions at ATLAS at, and CMS, two back-to-back -back die jet reconstructed in a very clean reconstruction. So you have almost no, I mean, you probably already removed the pileup and et cetera. So you have two very clean jets. And additionally, people approach this problem with global ver observables of the jet. So for example, mass distributions, PT distributions. And in fact, that's how jet quenching by the quark one plasma was first observed, was something called the RIA, which is how the jets, um, the, the differences between the distributions of the PTs in heavy ion with PP collisions. However, because I said that initial history of the jet will happen inside the quark one plasma heavy ion collisions, then the branching patterns will change. And so the jet will modify its history as it develops and has its adrenizes. So in principle, there will be imprinted information in a jet substructure about the interaction with the medium. So we need to start looking into the jet, inside the jet, not only the jet as a, as a, as a whole with its global properties, but actually the constituents of the jet and its substructure. And then the big question is, is there more information inside the jet that the current um, state-of-the-art substructure observables are not captured? So this has led us to our first work on this topic. So with Liliana and Guilherme, which are our two QCD theorists and the phenologists, uh, Hute and Nuno are our two Atlas experimentalists, and Filippo was doing a master's at the time with, uh, with Guilherme. So, and we use deep learning. So another jargon word that I have to introduce. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is just a subset of machine learning. So it's a subclass of machine learning algorithms that train something called neural networks, okay? I'm not going to introduce this. I have backup slides if you need a bit of introduction about what deep learning is, but they are very powerful machine learning algorithms and you must have hear, heard the name neural networks and deep learning all over the news, things like ChatGPT, diffusion models, and et cetera. So all of the most pro powerful modern machine learning models are all based on deep learning. So the idea was borrowed or a follow-up from Schwartz and collaborators, which is to use the images that uh, to, to use the calorimeter deposits at the jet as images. So if you think about a, a collide experiment, it's a cylinder where you have calorimeter cells where the jet deposits the energy in a hadronic calorimeter. So you actually have a natural grid and you can treat the grid as pixels and you can unfold a, a, the cylinder into an image, into a square image, right? So this is what they have done initially in a study to try to separate gluon initiated from quark initiated jets. So, and just as an image has three channels for colors, blue, green, and red, they then do something like that. So they, they use three channels as well, whereas the first channel they use the momentum of the charged particles, the second channel we use the momentum of the neutral particles, and in the third channel they use the multiplicity of the charged particles. Obviously not all of this information would be accessible in experimental setting, but it's still a phenomenological study about how one could do this. So they use something called a convolutional network, which is just which is basically top of the shelf deep learning architecture for image processing. So everything on computer vision using deep neural networks are with convolutional networks. And what you have is that you feed the image and then you're going to create some convolutional maps, which is going to be like a filter that's going to do with the receptive angles going to parse the image. And you do this progressively until you have a vector representing the image and then you classify, try to classify between a quark and a gluon. And by doing so, under the same conditions, they got state-of-the-art discrimination between quark-initiated versus gluon-initiated jets. But I went one too far. So we, uh, we continue on this idea for our specific case, which is to try to discriminate jets that uh, that were produced in the vacuum from jets that interacted with the medium. So how did we do this? We produced a sample of Z uh, plus jets. So these are simulated samples. Uh, where the Z and the jet are back to back. And the only difference between both samples is whether the medium is 
there or not. So if there's vacuum or not. So everything else is the same. So the same hard scattering processes. So all of these things we use Sherper as the base and uh, Monte Carlo generator. We use the same hydronizer. All the analysis steps are exactly the same. So you would prepare a sample from proton-proton collisions and a sample that would be from heavy ion collisions. So you're going to see that the nomenclature changes a bit between vacuum, proton-proton, or -proton unquenched, and medium, lead-lead, uh, uh, and quench jet. So I'm sorry about that, but community is still not completely um, decided on what to call what. And so we presented these two samples. And so, for example, for some of the global, so these are global jet um, variables distributions. So for you to see that there are differences between uh, medium and vacuum jets. So we do know that the jets that reverse the quarkum plasma tend to lose energy. And so you can see that the medium here, the PTs are shifted to the left as opposed to the vacuum and they tend to lose uh, constituents. So again, medium shifted to the left as opposed to the vacuum sample. For the Z plus jet sample, we also have a very nice, um, a very nice variable, which is X, XJZ, which is the ratio of the jet uh, of the PT of the Z over the PT of the jet. So the Z, is colorless, so the quark one plasma is completely transparent to the Z. So the Z traverses the quark one plasma without interacting with it, but the jet, but the jet does not. So in vacuum, you would expect it to to have something picked at one, very picked at one, almost as a delta Dirac. You don't have a complete delta Dirac because there are jet reconstruction algorithms errors and etc. and underlying radiation that can fall into the jet, but and then for the medium, you can see that there is an obvious suppression of the PT of the jet over the PT of the Z. So we have this shift to the left. So we are not going to use this variable. This is a bit of our, let's say, not ground truth, but our indication for uh, quenching or not. Okay. So this is a very clean phenological background to this study. So what did we do? Not only we did the images and we did something very similar to what the other guys did, but we only used two channels. We only used the PT and the multiplicity at each cell of the calorimeter. But then we used the two variations of the image, one which is not normalized. So the pixel actually has the, the absolute magnitude of the PT that landed in that calorimeter cell or the number of particles that have passed it. But the other one we actually normalize so that both channels, the sum of all the pixels equals to one. So this is a try to understand to what extent you can still derive some information which is independent of the PT because notice that PT is quite discriminant in itself. So we want to understand if there was discrimination beyond the PT. Then we also had something called a Lundgren coordinate. So um, when, once you have the jet and the jet was produced by NTKT clustering, you can then recluster in what it's called a cambridge hachen reclustering sequence that uh, will give you a clustering sequence which is ordered by the angle. And QCD, namely hadron showers, is angled order. So this has a very in not intuitive, but to say a very principled ordering for QCD processes at the level of the hadron, uh, the hadron shower. So the lone plane coordinates then becomes the, the, the values of uh, these, um, for example, Kt and delta r for each of the splitting. So you have here an example of what would be a lone plane, uh, a lone plane um, coordinate sequence, right? So you're going to have different points. And so you're going to have different distribution between vacuum and medium. Finally, just to understand how much of the PT of the jet and number of constituents of the jet are contributing to discrimination, we then trained a, a tabular a discriminant just on these two, just on these two variables, which was also neural network. So we, for the images, we did a, a convolutional neural network, just like Schwartz et al. And so you will see here we have two channels. So the PT. So this is a jet, so you can here see the deposit of energy of the jet in different calorimeter cells. Here's the, the number of constituents. And so we have then four layers of convolutions, and then finally trying to guess once, once you turn this image into a single vector, trying to understand if that was from a the vacuum sample or from the medium sample. So we do this for the normalized and non-normalized images. And for the Lund plane, we use a recurrent neural network. So recurrent neural network is a, is a network that reuses its, so you can do, give it like time steps as if there were time steps. And so it reuses the same bits of information over and over again as it tries to, to um, understand what's happening. So we, for this neural network, we present the jet uh, as the splittings of the cambridge uh requestering sequence. And so the coordinates in the Lund plane. And again, we try it, it's, 
jets at different can eat jets with different lengths so this is um you can actually have jets which are only like a few constituents and which are very big it's a it's irrelevant because it concatenates in the end everything into a single predictor and then tries to uh, predict whether if it's from the vacuum or the medium sample and then as i said just a very simple tabular dense neural network for those two global variables the jet pt and the number constituents of the jet okay so what is important to understand is that different architectures embody distinct assumptions and biases about the data so images assume that information is encoded in a grid which for a colorimeter solid is the case with a compositional bias how because the filters that are the receptive field that traverse the image will start by trying to create features from the local to the global aspect of the image. So there's a compositional bias. The Lund plane assumes that there is a significance to the order so that the step, so that the variables at the step T are dependent from the variables at step T minus one. And we therefore order them as a cambridge Hagen um, clustering sequence because there is uh, a QCD motivation for angle ordered splittings of the Cambridge Argon, um, Cambridge Argon uh, recursing signals. Whereas for the tabular data, there is no, no, no assumption besides that information is there, and that's it. So what do we get? We get good discrimination. And it's a very difficult problem. Uh, we already more or less knew it's a difficult problem because this has been a big discussion in the community, in the QCD community, in the study of the quark pole plasma. What we find out is that the uh, we get very good discrimination. So this is what's called a rock curve, which is receiver operating curve. And basically, once you have uh, once you have the train model, you have the output, the distribution of the output for that model. And you can, for different cuts, so for different thresholds of the output, you can compute the false positive rate and a true positive rate that you are getting. And for each one of those points, you put a, here in this plane, and then you uh, connect them with a line. So that would be the rock curve. A perfect classifier would have area one. So the perfect classifier this would just be a squared. And uh, a random classifier has a rock, uh, an area under the rock of 0 0.5. This is what it is, this um, dashed line. So what you can see is that the Lund, the, the Lund uh, recurrent neural network is the best discriminator. Now, actually, no, it's the unnormalized images followed by the Lund. But you can see that the global, which only has the PT of the jet and number constituents, has a, a rock curve area of around 73%. So there's a lot of this information that actually comes from the PT and the number constituents absolute uh, scale. So this is also seen that, and that the normalized images still have an area of greater than 50%. So there is something that it's learning which goes beyond just having the information about the PT and the number constituent scale of the jet. How do we know this is actually separating modified from unmodified jets? We now perform a cut at different acceptance uh, efficiencies. So, for example, here we have some of the observables that we talked about, and we, we put all the jets together, and then we did a cut at different uh, levels, okay, of acceptance of medium-like jets. And what you can see is that the vacuum, the, the vacuum-like jets, so the jets which did not pass the cut, always follow the distribution of our vacuum. This, uh, vacuum sample. This means that what is being rejected is vacuum-like, whereas what is passing the cut is even more different than the medium sample than what we had before. So all the open blue symbols that you can see here are more far away from the vacuum than the medium sample. So we are indeed able to remove vacuum-like jets from the sample of uh, heavy ion collisions. Now. We went directly to deep learning, but you could have asked before, wait a second, maybe you should have actually studied the jet substructure observables that you already talked about. And in fact, that was, in, in hindsight, maybe this should have been the first paper, but this was what followed up. So this was a paper, me, Guilherme, and Marco, so Marco van Leuven, which you might recognize is the current spokesperson of Alice. And so we had this question, what can the jet substructure observables actually give us in terms of, of separating uh, quench from unquenched jets. So this is a very recent paper. I don't know if you noticed that. So this is from this month. Okay, and I've only put together a couple of slides or so, so that this presentation doesn't go too overboard, okay? Uh, but we also have the code and the data available. So this is something that we were very careful about to be sure that the entire paper is actually reproducible and it has instructions on how to reproduce the results of our paper. So here we, 
did a survey of, of a comprehensive set of jets uh, substructural observables. So we went from also some of them are high level, for example, global level, I mean, so for example, the of constituents, the mass of the jet and et cetera, but also then substructure there. So we have these angularities, which are defined like this. So this will more or less try to capture the girth in how the distribution of the constituents inside the jet along the jet axis are distributed, right? The distribution of the constituents in this traverse moment, the traverse plane to the jet axis, but also used N subjectiveness, which is a, an attempt of measuring how many subjects the jet has, but also the jet charge, and then variables that you get from grooming uh, procedures. So for soft drop grooming, there are some uh, intuitive ones, which is the, the radius of the splitting at which the cut is uh, installed, the, the momentum fraction at that split and the amount of times that that split happened. And we also studied a more recent grooming approach by, um, by Alba, Alba Soto, Soto Antoso, which is dynamical grooming and, uh, and collaborators, obviously, which is quite non-intuitive. <laughs> so basically there is this quantity that you can compute along the jet. And when it is, once you find the max, then you say that it's when you have to split the jet. And you can then derive not only the value of this kappa, but also the R and the Z at which that split exists. Okay, so these are quite high level. Uh, and there hasn't been that much work into them because it's actually very recent, since it's from 2020. I also have to say, I'm very, very thankful for both Corina and Alba for providing code and for allowing to reshare their code with my analysis for this, okay? So what did we do? So we did an extensive study where we actually did three different uh, three different machine learning based analysis. One, which was to study the linear correlations in, using also principal component analysis, another using autoencoder, which tries to capture non linear relations between the observables. And then finally, trying to understand what would be the combinations of, um, of these observables that would maximize the discrimination between both cases, between quenched and unquenched samples. Okay, so here you can see that I'm not using vacuum and medium, I'm using quenched and unquenched, but Different, different collaborators will, that will use different names. So uh, it's very similar to our previous case, the sample, but in this case, actually more difficult to discriminate because as you can see here that the, that the um, distribution of the, um, of the PT is actually uh, the same for both cases. So we actually use the die jet, okay? And so once you have, uh, once you apply the cut, the distribution of the momentum is the same. So here we completely factored out the dependency of the momentum on discrimination. So we're really just interested in seeing the impact of the substructures observables to discriminate between both cases. So our first discovery was that the vast majority of these uh, observables are actually all highly correlated, okay? So as you can see here, you can cluster them through correlations. So this is basically a cluster along the correlation matrix between these observables. And uh, and surprisingly, the phi and the, and the rapidity of the jets are uncorrelated with anything else, which is normal. We already knew that. But then almost everything are just basically angularity types of um, observables. And then we have the, the the charge of the jet, which also stands out separately. So these are very interesting, and they are very similar for both cases. So there are some difference. So some variables become less correlated to the main bulk of variables than once you turn on the medium. But generally speaking, most of the variables are actually highly correlated. What we also found out is that uh, you basically saturate your discrimination potential by using just a couple of pairs. So we trained a full BTT. So the BTT is like, is it discriminated to just tabular data? So we, we trained a, a boosted decision tree with all these observables. We got a rock of around 70%. Notice that this is a lot, lot smaller than in our previous paper because this is a more difficult process, a more difficult problem. And once you actually just reduce to some of the variables and you start cutting uh, some of the most discriminant variables, you basically get exactly the same rejection efficiency for the same cuts than the BDT would get. And in fact, you can see, for example, here that once you cut uh, in some of these variables, you get exactly what you would get from the BDT. So it's very, we were quite surprised. Another thing that you notice in this, for example, here we have the histogram for uh, unquenched and quenched, so vacuum and medium for two observables that we identified, which is the RZ, which is just the, uh, the, the mean aperture of the jet and uh, weighted by the, the PT fraction. And then the KT, kappa 
KTD, which was that kappa from the dynamical grooming from ALBA and collaborators. And you can see something interesting, which is there is a population migration along the distribution, right? So you start with vacuum here, and then once you have medium, it comes here. So this means that the cor correlations, this is something that we found, is that the correlations between observers actually seem to survive the existence of the medium, which was something which we were not completely expecting. So the population migrates along these lines, but still you can see here where you could then try to focus to find more uh, medium-like than vacuum-like. What am I working on this now? Also with Guilherme, but also with uh, Joan, which is a student. We're trying to go beyond the two papers that we've done before. So the two papers that we've done before, we had different biases. In the deep learning architectures, we had the bias of the image, which was a comp compositional bias um, from local to global. We also had the bias of the recurrent neural network on a sequence of loom plane coordinates. And uh, in our previous paper, in the last paper, we had the bias of the observables themselves. So when you're using high level observables proposed by a theorist or a phenomenologist, you are assuming that it's interesting because it was proposed by a human being. So we tried to go beyond that. Okay, and so what is the least biased study that we can do? So there is this architecture in the in the in the machine learning literature called uh, a transformer, which is a multi-head attention mechanism, and you have the transformer block, uh, and it comes from a seminal paper called "Attention is All You Need." And so this is the backbone of all the large language models that you have seen in the news lately, like ChatGPT and etc. So this is the backbone of those of those models. And it actually is invariant under input permutation. What does this mean? This means that you can feed this neural network, the jet, as a set of its constituents without any specific ordering, okay? In fact, uh, for natural language, so for chat, GPT, et cetera, in fact, they actually have to put a positional embedding so that the transformer can have uh, the information about the position of things. But here, we don't want that. We want to train a neural network that takes the jet as a set of its constituents as four momenta. So we're talking about PTs and, um, and the distance to the jet axis and tries to do this task of trying to separate between vacuum-like and medium-like. So it's the same digest data set that we saw before. So the one which is very difficult to do. And these are preliminary results, but these are incredibly good results, okay? We have for the first time in the community evidence that it is possible to completely isolate modified jets. So this is something that when we start, when me and Guilherme start doing these papers a few years back, he was convinced, or at least he was very suspicious that it was not possible. That it was not possible to completely remove vacuum-like jets from a sample that comes from a heavy ion collisions. And in this paper, we actually have the proof, or at least the first evidence. Obviously, many caveats here. This is simulation. It's not completely um, in equal stages as a, an experimental analysis. It's a phenological study. But even at the phenological level, we can't completely isolate modified jets. And here, for comparison, we, we also use a BDT, but this time around, I optimize the BDT. So instead of having 70%, it has 71% of area under the curve, but you can see that our transformer explodes to 84%. So this is a huge difference, okay? Because there is the, the notion of, it is exponentially more difficult to get to the left, uh, to the left up corner of the, of the rock, okay? So this is such a good result that we actually are checking it twice doing all the checks. So this is, might take some time, even though I already have plots with LaTeX fonts, we actually still a few, um, few, a few weeks of work ahead. But hopefully within the next two months, we put this on our part. So that is our expectation before summer at least. Okay, and I'm going to completely change the topic. So for those of you that like collider physics more than BSM model building, you already took the, the most out of this talk. For those of you that prefer uh, model building and don't care much about collider physics, now the rest of the talk is for you. So my PhD was actually on model building and string phenomenology. So this is a lot closer to my heart. And uh, whereas the previous one I was working with uh, QCD theorists and phenomenologists that were interested in data-driven methods and approached me, this one is something that actually came from my own, um, from my own ideas. So for those of you that are used to create uh, BSM models and then have to try to validate it against a very large array of, of constraints, this is what you normally do. 
you sample a point from your parameter space, you then you have your computational routine, for example, Sphenus, Obsusium, Micromega, Skullcap, that can be whatever you want to compute some observables. And then you're going to um, check against uh, experimental constraints. And then you either you pass the experimental constraints and you keep the point, or you throw it away and you don't keep the point. So this can be computational time consuming, as you all know. And for high constrained problems, this can be but the, the low sampling efficiency can be prohibitively low to the point that eventually you will give up on using all the constraints and you're going to start simplify your problem. You start using alignment limits. You start uh, by looking around corners of the parameter space that you already know that exist some points. You start using less constraints and then you say that in future work, you will try to address them even though you're not completely sure how you're going to do it in future work and et cetera. So some people try to solve this using machine learning. So the, the prior to our work, the main the main uh, ideas were to try to, to try to reduce the overhead of the computational routine by trying to either predict what the observers will be given the sample. So you can do this by training a machine learning regressor, which is given a, a parameter space point, trying to predict what the observer will be so that you do not have to call the computational routine. Because for example, even for relatively simple models like the CMSSM or the PMSSM, Sphino plus Micromegas can sometimes take almost up to a second, okay? So this would be one way of trying to do it. Or some people are more, uh, try to be more ambitious, just try to immediately predict if the point was going to be, is going to be valid or not, even um, what you've seen before. Another approach, which has been looked for by Hollingsworth and collaborators, is to try to replicate new points from the good points that you already found. So for example, you already have a collection of good points from an early scan, and then you train a generative model. And in this case, they did a normalizing flow network to try to produce more valid points that, uh, before you present it to your, um, to, to your computational routine. However, all of these approaches have um, uh, the same um, the same shortcoming, okay? So if you remember from a study say from early on, machine learning paradigm is that of statistical learning. So you can only learn from the data that you have. So all of those approaches will require large amounts of training data. More specifically, will require large amounts of valid points. So for example, if, if you're a regressor, uh, if you don't have enough points, your regressor will not be able to map the parameter space to observables correctly because you might not even have coverage, full coverage of the parameter space. If you have a classifier, again, the same problem. If you don't have the full cover of the parameter space, you might do the wrong guessing. And for resampling, if you've only been able to find parameter, valid parameter points in the subregion of the parameter space, it will only resample points from that subregion. It will not be able to sample new points elsewhere because again, that would be outside of the compact support of the data it was trained on. So all of these approaches have the same problem. So for highly constrained heuristic scans, this becomes computational prohibitive to get enough valid points for these methods to be valid. So for example, the, the paper that uses the generative uh, normalization flow starts off with a million valid points. And you could argue that if I already have a million valid points, I already solved the problem of sampling, right? So the problem is how do I approach this problem without having a large amount of data or, and more specifically without having a large amount of valid points. And this is uh, where we made our first contribution that uh, it was out last year and financially published in the PRG this year. And our code is available for whoever uh, is interested in these things, which is exploring the parameter space using machine learning in AI algorithms. So the aha moment for me was when I said, well, we just need to change the sampling, okay? Because all of the other problems, in the end, they're still sampling from a uniform prior. They actually do not change the way that points are produced to the computational routine and the constraints. And for me, I would like to quit the computational routine and the constraints because that is an oracle of truth. So why I do not want to, to get rid of this because this is the ground truth for me. So let's try to change the, the sampling itself. So how do we do this? The idea is that once you have a point and you can compute your observable, you can measure more or less how far off it is from being valid. So for example, in this case, an observable with two bounds, an upper bound and a lower bound. If you pass by this function, a max of zero minus a value of surplus, Upper bound, lower bound and observe minus the upper bound, which has this form. Whenever you are inside the bounds, 
then this is zero. So the point is valid, it's fine. If you are outside, it's invalid, but you have a distance, a notion of a linear distance of how far you are. Also, I need to, to, to say that it's irrelevant if it is linear or not, it just has to be monotonic. We did studies on that. So I have a notion on how bad the point is. And even for the random sampling, this, these two statements are the same. So the set of all valid points for a certain model will be the point such that the value of this function is zero, but this, it's also the same to say it is all the points that minimize this function, all right? So finding valid points is the same as minimizing this function. And so luckily for us in machine learning and in AI literature, there is a wealth of what it's called black box optimization algorithms. So in this case, I treat the computational routine and the constraints as a black box. The only thing that I can do is I can only provide parameters points and then I get the value of that function back. And then I put an optimization algorithm to try to find the points that do exactly that, that minimize that, um, that function. So uh, very quickly, so I'm just going to, with, we did CMSSM and PMSSM. I'm only, only going to show the PMSSM cases here. You can look at um, uh, the paper for the results. We also did Higgs mass and Higgs mass plus dark matter. So we used um, micromegas for the dark matter and used pheno for, for the spectrum. And we did both, uh, both these constraints by passing through that C function. In this paper, we summed them, okay? Uh, we did some studies to see if free scaling would have changed our results. They didn't change, but as you're going to see, this is something that we're working on now. So what we're trying to do is minimize this function, which is the sum of that C function, that max zero of the value of the constraint of the, of the both of the constraints. And our upper and lower bounds are here because it's a super symmetric model. The theoretical constraints on the Higgs mass are greater than the experimental constraints. And so we actually have a quite high um, bound for the Higgs mass here. And for the dark matter, we use the, the usual one. So we wanted to compare different black box optimization algorithms and we went to the literature and there are many classes of them. So we were able to identify three classes and three examples. So one example for each class, there is a Bayesian optimization algorithm we use, which is called three parts and estimated. Then we also use the genetic algorithm, which has a fantastic name, non-dominated sort in genetic algorithm two. And we also use a non-genetic, but also evolutionary algorithm uh, called another great name, covariant matrix approximation, evolutionary strategy, SMICE. Okay, so these algorithms are all different between them, the way that they work, the way that they explore. So they all work differently and we wanted to assess how the, the differences would then impact the final results, okay? So it's important to take that all of these algorithms are sequential. So uh, they will, the point that they're going to suggest at a certain step T, it will depend on the points that happened before, okay? So this is where effective or emergent intelligence, that's why these algorithms are following to, in, within the AI uh, nomenclature, will uh, learn. It's also important to say that two of them have a learning component. So the Bayesian one has a learning component and the evolutionary one as well, but the genetic one does not have. So the genetic one is not a machine learning algorithm. So, but most importantly, none of them requires any data to start off with, okay? So you have a, you have your Sphino with Micromagus pipeline ready and you can just plug this in even in your first run and just let them go and fetch good points for you, okay? So they will adapt their search dynamically. So our methodology, we use a, a Python package called Optuna, which already has implementation of these algorithms. And for each scan, so each scan is CMSSM, PMSSM, and then only Higgs mass or Higgs mass plus dark matter. We did uh, 500 independent scans, which we called episodes, each one of them, uh, doing uh, a total of 2,000 points sequentially. So in, in the end, for each scan, we did a million points, okay? So the points, the, the samples were compared with different metrics. So not only the efficiency, so efficiency is how much of these million points are actually valid. So the ratio of the points are actually valid, uh, um, valid. Uh, but also the Wasserstein uh, distance against uniform distribution, which tries to measure the, um, the, um, the, the coverage of the parameter space. So in that case, we want less is better, and also the mean Euclidean distance of the points that were provided. So again, less is better to try to understand what was the coverage of the parameter space, because it does not suffice to have valid good points. We want to cover the parameter space. 
So in the end, what you have, so these are the results uh, for the valid points for, diff uh, for the different samplers for the Higgs mass and for the dark matter density. You can see that the red one is the one that differs the most from the distribution that you get from the random sampler, whereas the Bayesian and the, um, and the genetic one are not that far off what you would get, but it's not the same and it's okay not to be the same. We are not trying to get the posterior distribution using likelihoods. That is what you use a, a Monte Carlo Markov chain sampling study for. We are, we are trying to find the regions of the brain space which are valid. So it's okay for the distributions not to be what you would get from an MCMC or from the random scan. In terms of cataplots, so here you can see uh, some of the features that the different samples can provide. So the TPE, which is the Bayesian one, seems to be the one that's closest to the random sampler in terms of um, density and spread out of the valid points. And then you start seeing things that you already expect if you know how the algorithms work. So the genetic algorithms, you start seeing like these stripes, which is like cloth stripes, right? So this is common. These are called schemas in genetic algorithms. And this is basically means that there are some traits of the population that will survive multiple generations if they are good. So as you can see here, what basically this is saying is that the genetic algorithm sampling, once it fixed the value of AT, uh, then that value probably survived multiple generations. So some of, some of this, the same, like, these vertical lines represent probably an entire episode, like all of the points along that generation, uh, along that run, okay? Then the SMISE, the SMISE works uh, in an interesting way. So the SMISE works as effectively as a Gaussian that is moving around the parameter space looking for points. So the, the SMISE will always have this, um, will always give points which feels like paint brushes, right? So you can see here like these paint brushes, it means that's the, um, the Gaussian, uh, yes, the normal distribution got there, found a lot of points, and, and then it is repeated. So we turned on a, a self-restart option so that it wouldn't get stuck in the global, in the global uh, minimum, okay? And because of that, it will then give you a lot of points in certain regions that the random sample would not give. But that, that, nonetheless, it's still giving you the valid points. So in terms of efficiency, the differences are completely paradigm shifting. So for example, for the most constraining case, which is the CMSSM, uh, for the Higgs mass and the dark matter density, the random sampler has an efficiency of around 0.1% whereas the evolutionary strategy gets to 43%, okay? So these are two orders of magnitude above. And you can see similar similar um, for the PMSSM, so this is highly, highly efficient. Then comes the NSG2, and then the TPE is the one that is not as efficient as the others, but still provides uh, sampling efficiency above one order of magnitude. Also notice that once you start getting our efficiencies of around 0.1%, you're basically very close to saturating the efficiency. So there will not be more gaining from this. So you'd have to go for a more difficult problem in order to see further benefits from different algorithms. So this is how they work. So remember that each, each, independent, each independent run was 2000 sequential points. And uh, the width here is a bootstrap. Um, it's a bootstrap one standard deviation of the 500 independent scans. And so this is very interesting. So here you have the average loss. And for the random sampler, obviously the average loss is going to be on average, constant along the entire run for all the four cases, right? And all the others very quickly decrease the average loss of the, of the next step. So this is also a rolling average of the 50 previous uh, trials. So you can see here the convergency to the minimum happening in, in all of the in all of the intelligence scanners. And then in terms of efficiency, it is basically the, the not the reverse, but the complementary of this analysis, which is you see that the average efficiency saturates very quickly, very close to one for this for this evolutionary strategy and also for some of the cases for the uh, genetic algorithm. And then the TP always has higher efficiency than the random set, but it stabilizes very quickly. So. This is for you to have an idea on how this works. So moving forward with this idea, what have you been working on? And I don't know who I'll be talking to, I'm almost, almost done. So I'm, this will be less than one hour.
So with Werner, uh, and now with uh, one of his students, Andreas, and my student, Fernando, we are trying to follow, uh, follow up on a more difficult problem. Because after seeing what I presented so far, you could have asked, what about a very difficult problem? And hold on to your seats. I have two very difficult problems I'm going to show you. So one of them is based on the work that Werner has done with collaborators on a model which has a leptogenesis and a G minus two solution. Uh, it's called a genetic model. That so it's also a dark matter model, right? And and this is a very interesting problem because you can see the content the, the contention between what your model is trying to do. So on the one hand, you want to have uh, you want to explain the G minus two, right? So in order to explain the G minus two, uh, which is uh, going to be this uh, this plot, you want uh, you don't want these fermions to be too light, otherwise the loop suppression is going to be too big. So you 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 will want to 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 have them a bit higher. But if they are too high, they also go into the loop of the neutrino. So then they will spawn neutrino mass. So then what you have to do is okay. In that case, I'm I'm going to keep these things light, but I'm going to increase these couplings. Right, so that's the loop contribution increases. But once you do that, then you're going to have charged um, lactoflavor change in currents, which are which you have bounds from experiments. So there are many contending forces between the different constraints that you're trying to implement. So what have we actually tried to do? So uh, we so in the end, so let me just uh, also say so we have around sixty three parameters. Okay because actually we are using the full complex numbers and we are using 23 constraints. So the Higgs mass, the matter uh, density, the trim data, so including mixing angles and CP violation, that's why we have complex parameters, but also the flavor violation bounds, okay? So this is a very difficult problem. We are approaching it on a different way, okay? So we're approaching it as a multi-objective optimization problem because we have that many, many different, um, that many different uh, constraints. So as you recall from our previous paper, we only had two constraints, we summed them together. There was this question that we had between us if we should try to put them to the same scale so that one would not uh, overdo the other and et cetera. A way around this is actually not to sum them together, but try to optimize them, all of them jointly. So there is this notion of multi-objective problem, which is you try to, in the, in the objective space, so you can, you can go to an objective space and you can put each point where it falls under, and you are trying to minimize all of these objectives. So you're going to create something which is called a Pareto front, which are the points which are better than all the points which are inside this region, right? So these are all the points that are better than those, but they are not better amongst them. So they're equally good amongst them. So some of them will be better for one, one of the objects, but not for the other and etc. So this is the Pareto front. And what you try to do using a genetic algorithm, in this case, we use NSGA3, which is the evolution of NSGA2, which is specifically crafted for uh, many, many objectives. And we have 23 of them, right? So uh, we, uh, with NSGA3 tries then genetically tries to get the points which are better, 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 better than eventually. For our case, we do know that the good point is when the objectives are zero. Also, because we want to make this even more difficult, we got rid of the Casas Ibarra parameterization. So in the previous papers, in, in their paper, uh, collaborators, they use the Casas Ibarra parameterization, which for those of you that don't know, is you actually use low energy neutrino data as inputs, then you rotate back to your uh, BSM parameters, and then those BSM parameters will have to will have to um, will have to agree with some perturbative or unitarity bounds. But you already are working uh, with the correct neutrino mass, right, and angles and etc. So we went beyond. So we, we gave up on that. So we're actually doing the more difficult thing, which is we actually are sampling the BSM parameters and then checking the low energy data of the neutrinos, okay? So, so far, what I can tell you is that random sampling, we did a 1 million points test, but to be honest, we believe that random sampling efficiency is far lower than this. And I don't have plots because the, the students are still, this one is mostly the students doing the heavy lifting. So they are working uh, uh, on this right now, but they already have obtained convergences. So we already have an SGA3 working on this problem, getting you right good points after 10,000 of the order of that. So we already solved the problem for this one. So for very difficult problems, this approach still works. And in fact, I'm working even another one, which you can say it's probably even more difficult. It depends on what it is with George Lowe in Lisbon. We only have 16 parameters. So this is double Higgs, uh, triple 
Higgs uh, double model, okay, a 3 HDM. And we only have 16 parameters, but we have 60 constraints. And the constraints include the STU parameters, the oblique STU parameters, the balance from below of the, of the, super, of the scalar potential, uh, perturbative unitarity in your powers. Uh, we also need the LHC uh, Higgs coupled constant. So we have both the mu's and the kappas from Atlas. And we actually are running now with the most recent constraints. And the random search efficiency sampling for this is, a, is at most one in one billion. Okay, so you would need one week with 16 cores to get around 10 points. And so what people do, and you can go to their paper and see this is exactly what they've done, they go to alignment limits. So for you to have an idea why this is such a difficult problem, here I did a collective flag, so points that are good with STU, points that are good with all the news, points that are good with all the kappas, points that are good from BS gamma, and etc. And you can see that some of these constraints, for example, unitarity, balance from below, are highly perpendicular. So the effective dimensionality of the parameter space is almost of no measure. And you know that sampling, trying to find a no measure space with random sampling is basically impossible. So this is why this is such a difficult problem. And what I can tell you is our method solves this problem, okay? So we went beyond the line limit. So here I actually have around 10 to 20 points of random sampling. As you can see, they're scattered, very small points. We also made a scan along the alignment limit. So here, alpha one and beta one. So the alignment limit is that beta one is not good in alpha one by 50%, but not only that, also the gamma one, gamma two, and some of the masses. And uh, this converges so quickly that now the problem is not trying to get points, is but instead trying to explore the parameter space, okay? So whereas this takes around a week on 16 cores, you can get points like this in minutes on your laptop, okay? So this is a paradigm shift on sampling. And here you already have, uh, these are preliminary results and this paper will take a little bit longer to, to, to produce because there are many uh, working, uh, many moving wheels. But you can see that within minutes you can completely explore everything. So here we have different, uh, uh, different variations of the algorithms with, which already include extra exploration. And you can see, for example, you can even force the algorithm to say, go beyond the alignment limits. So this would be a very nice complementary scan to this one, right? And then you can start saying, well, in this exploration, I don't have a lot of high values for beta. So then you can then scan uh, slices along the time beta or beta. So you can completely cover the parameter space. So you can see that it's so fast to get points that you can start doing these variations. And so what we're doing now is trying to understand if, if what we get outside of the alignment limit is different in terms of physics or phenomenology. So what you would, look for um, in experiments. And look here, for example, that whereas for alignment limits, you normally have this very awkward cut in the valid parameter space, right? So you have like these hypercones where gamma two cannot be greater than 50% of gamma one, whereas our points, uh, our scans completely cover all the valid, all the possible points for gamma one and gamma two. So what we're trying to do is trying to get this to a lot else. The reason why this has a lot of white as compared to this one is that there are like around five to 10 times less points here than there are here. Okay, so these were just a, an even quicker study. All right, so I'm going to conclude because this was a lot to go through. So uh, in recent years, HAP has seen a, a percentage in interest in both AI and machine learning applications. Okay, most of these uh, in HAP have been carried out uh, in experimental context, okay? So we all know that experimentalists use a lot of machine learning. So nowadays, BTAG are neural networks. Uh, you already have BDTs in analysis. So experimentalists do use a lot of machine learning in their workflows nowadays. So for them, it was really not novel. What was novel was the resurgence of the interest in itself. However, I hope that you are convinced that there's a lot of possibilities for phenomenology and theory that we have to start exploring for real, okay? Moving forward, the future of our field in technology and theory will pass by AI and ML. So as two examples I've been working on, so for collider phenomenology in the very specific case of trying to identify quench jets by the quark quantum plasma, we have shown that you can get state-of-the-art discrimination by using neural networks without using any type of high level um, uh, observable, okay? And there is more information inside the jet that's not contained in the observables that, that we, the community, have been using so far, okay? So there is more theoretical 
studies of QCD of angelization in the quarantine plasma that, uh, that needs to be done. Okay, and also we provided evidence that there are unique fragmentation patterns imprinted by the quark world plasma because we were able to completely isolate modified jets from the sample. So uh, these are very important results for uh, QCD theorists and ophthalmologists. On the BSM size, I hope that you are convinced that we were able to solve the random sampling efficiency problem for highly constrained models. Okay, and this will lead to the possibility of finding new regions and studying regions that you haven't studied before from a logical point of view. So this is a type of uh, follow-up work that we're doing now. So our next two papers are not as focused on the efficiency because we already know that we solved the efficiency problem, are focused on the coverage of the parameter space and what does this mean for phenomenology. More generally, it's also very important to say that things are moving very fast. So the research, academic and industry research on AI and ML moves really, really fast. So for example, you know, ChatGPT and also the stable diffusion are less than a year old, okay? And even now you already have ChatGPT4 and stable diffusion already being suppressed by others. So we can only imagine what's in store. So for example, here you have, I asked last year, ChatGPT, in your opinion, what is the great next application of artificial intelligence and machine learning to high energy physics from knowledge and theory? So the, almost all of it is just platitudes about experimental applications, which is useless for us. But then it says something interesting. Additionally, AI and ML techniques could be applied in developing new theoretical models, which is the second half of my talk, and understanding the underlying mechanism of physical phenomena, which is the first half of my talk. Obviously, the disclaimer here is that I do not use ChatGPT to decide what I'm working on. And then, uh, so here is for the paper that we have on quantum machine learning, the student, Miguel Prefutu, uh, was so excited about all of this that then he went to stable diffusion to create an icon. So this was generated, this image here was generated by an AI, okay? So AI and ML applications for hack theory and phenomenology are still relatively in infancy when we compare to experiment with our experimental colleagues, but there's a very, very exciting future ahead. And last but not least, it's actually a very lot of fun to develop and to implement AI machine learning uh, to theory and theory. And so just institutional propaganda. I know this is um, more for the Latin America, but uh, it might be interesting participating in this year's SUSE. Okay, so SUSE happens every year and SUSE is always preceded by pre-SUSE, which is um, a, a summer school, which has many topics and this year, I was, I'm very thankful to have been included in this list of superstars, including Fernando Cavedo, Marika Taylor, Stephen Martin, etc. I'm going to give a quick two hour course on machine learning for SUSE model building. So basically going through some of the things that I talked about today. And that's it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, so before we, we go to, to the, to see the, the audience, maybe we can have a, a question round, uh, by the participants. I don't know if maybe Nicolas and Roberto have any questions or maybe I can start. Okay. So let, let me start. Um, so, so one thing uh, that, that, um, regarding the first part of of your talk, um, you were comparing uh, jet properties uh, when the jet was in vacuum and when the jet was going through a medium. Um, but I was wondering mm -hmm. uh, what would happen if like uh, uh, the jet is produced ne near the boundary of the medium, right? And you and you have it going through me from medium into vacuum. So could could that happen, and what what would be modified in in that case? So that can happen for sure. So this is what this image is showing here, right? So if, for example, in this giant jet event, you can have um, one of the jets being produced at the rim of the um, um, of the quark quantum plasma. So what this means is that quenching is not a binary characteristic of the jet. Mm. What this means is that quenching is somehow a continuous effect. So how you measure, how you quantify it, how many degrees of freedom, that is the open question in PCD, right? Mm. But what we do know is that in fact, inside the sample of heavy ion jets, so jets that were producing heavy ion collisions, 
Some of them interacted a lot. Some of them did not interact as much. Mm. So the ones that didn't inter interact as much would then be vacuum-like. So there'd be jets that would appear as vacuum. Mm. All right. So, uh, and whereas with vacuum, you have um, a definite binary category because you can always prepare proton-proton digest events. Okay. So the LHC does. Yeah. Billions, millions, trillions of digests uh, every year. So we have a like a candle, right? So we have a candle for what the vacuum jet is, but we do not have a candle for what the modified jet is. So mm -hmm. what we what we claim is that these methodologies are removing vacuum-like jets from the heavy ion collision jets. But inside that, there will be jets that will be modified a lot, jets that will be modified less. So. Mm. So, so, so the question was, was more or less in the, in the direction of would, would it make sense to, to or, or would it be possible to simulate uh, um, jets that have got both components? Um, would, yeah, so this has, been a, this has been an ongoing question. And so I'm not, I'm not a KCT technologist or theorist. I think that was is clear by now, right? Um, I'm a model builder. And um, so I've had this question with the Adam a lot. And um, what I can tell you is this. There are many Monte Carlo simulators for jet quenching, for heavy ion collisions and et cetera. They all seem to use different physics to motivate it. They're all calibrated against experimental things in the end, some are observables, but uh, there's a bit of a, so some people like ones, they don't like all this. And Guillermo um, has a lot of collaborators and we have been working a lot with Jewel. So we have, op I have opened up this question. So is there something that can be done? In Jewel, that is not possible. So Jewel mm -hmm. does not do that, okay? Um, so that would not be possible in Jewel. I think there are other simulators that, that might be possible, but then they fail in some aspects where our studies would not be possible to do. So, but in principle, that would be very interesting. And actually, it's something that we're actually very interested in is having a vacuum jet. What would happen if we pass it through medium? So, which is exactly your mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. So that is yeah. that is something that we are very keen on exploring at some point. So that is something. We have many, you know, like back of the envelope ideas, like to-do lists of things for future projects, and that is there. I can tell you that. For the time being, we okay. don't have that that level of data, simulated data, but we don't have that type of data. Because I think that like Gent does this kind of of things, but but okay, maybe other medium like <laughs> like blocks of material. Well, yes, right. <laughs> yeah, I just think yeah, just think is that Gent is interaction of radiation and and streams of the, with normal matter, so. So for mm -hmm. example, when you run, even when you run things, for example, so experimentalists will run GMs to uh, simulate um, um, collider interactions, right? So the way that the event interacts with a collider. So that is done, but this is exotic matter. So modeling the quark one plasma itself is an area of research. That's why there are so many generators of mm -hmm. the quark one plasma and jet quenching. So when you pick one of them, you're actually more or less subscribing to a certain choice of physical processes to model the quark one plasma because we do not have uh, a formal way of doing it. So non-perturbative QCD is a paramount example of something which is formally well-defined, but is computationally intractable. So all of these quark one plasma simulators rely on different approaches, okay? Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any other question? I have a couple more, but probably let's allow the yeah, other. Here comes for, your... for Miguel. So Miguel, very nice the, the talk. I mean, it, it's very impressive the how useful could be the all this type of modeling for the using machine learning. My question was related re, regarding the part of VSM, Vision Standard Model mm -hmm. case. Because as I parallel understood, that you, you can tell me if I'm, if it is correct. What is you you have to start with with the process of training your 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 to, to tune in the, the the machine learning in order to be more efficient in the to to look for good points once you so so in, not not our approach. 
our approach, it will learn as it goes. Yes, yeah, yeah, but in the sense, it, when when you you were estimating, for instance, in another part, the part regarding to the efficiency of the of the of the algorithm, uh, do you know more or less yes. how it grows as soon as you are started to explore the? Because I I think that in the early stage of the search in the space of parameters, it's almost like a, a standard Monte Carlo, just. Yes, so here you can see start to be more efficient, but do you know more or less how much points you start to get efficient, uh, start to deviate it from the from the exactly. So one of the things that we've learned from this paper is that the metric of the global efficiency is irrelevant because I instead of 2,000 points, if I would have a million points, I would have almost efficient one in almost all of them. So the, your question is, how many points do I actually have to burn through to use Monte Carlo terminology to get to the minimum? So here you can say that it's very quick, right? So if this is 500 points, you have around 100 points until you get good points. And remember that the random sampler, the efficiency is 0.1%. So at least it converges 10 times quicker, okay? Um, what we have now is a lot more than that. So for example, uh, I actually do not have the points for this, but you can get valid points here after a thousand tries. Mm. Whereas the random sampling efficiency is below one in a billion. So we're already talking about six orders of magnitude improvement. So six orders of magnitude is the difference between a second and a month, right? So it's... It's it's a big thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my... <laughs> mm, cool. So and and kind of a following up question in that aspect. I mean, one of the nice stuff, let's say, of when one is doing search of the using a standard Monte Carlo for the space of parameter of a BSM model with dark matter or whatever, is the stuff that you can parallelize in. I mean, you can run the same process in many, many computers at the same time and then gather all the po good points. In this mm -hmm. scenario with machine learning, I, I, I guess you can also run it in many computers, but then the learning part of the of each different code, is it possible to merge it again in kind of a common common knowledge for the... For the so, for the, they, it's a, I mean, this is as paralyzable as a Monte Carlo chain, because the Monte Carlo chain is also sequential. Mm -hmm. So you can have multiple of these in parallel. And in fact, these are multiple parallel runs. So that's the thing. So each one so each one of them can be run on a single core. And so you run multiple of them in parallel. They are independent amongst them. So there is no communication. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to have a common oracle to keep track of some information? possible, not the focus of my work at this stage. So at this stage, I'm trying to completely explore the uh, three Higgs doublet model with 2022 LHC data uh, and studying what is left beyond the alignment limit because that's what their literature has not looked into, right? Efficiencies like that, it will come to, to it. So there are already two Python packages that try uh, with different approaches for scans, which are not like ours, they are re uh, using uh, the, the things like the previous attempts. And even though, even though my Fernando's, which is my PhD student, even though Fernando's PhD program uh, project was the idea was to create a Python package for that, like I'm not in a rush to get to that point. Eventually we're going to get to a point where this is going to be distributed in a way that those, those problems will be addressed. <laughs> Because notice that I, I have very little. Notice that I have almost very little motivation to do fine tuning like tweaking like that when I can get thousands of valid points in minutes on my computer. So it's so I, I'm I'm promising you hyper efficient parameter scans on your laptop. So yeah, if this can be much parallel and putting on a cluster, yes, eventually one day. But that's not the game that we're playing at now. <laughs> Of course. So, and my last question regarding uh, all these, also for the, because many of the 
people that follow the webinar, people doing PhD or so on and so forth, different type of uh, background as well. So the most of these studies that you did, you did, you were using framework based on Python or forget because I know yes. uh, Garner Paul yes. likes mathematics and I was like great package for mathematics. So it's Python. Yes, I, yeah, I use Python virtually for everything. I know that Mathematica has some machine learning implementations and etc. Mathematica is very heavy. I for 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 long numerical studies, Mathematica, I think it falls short. I like Python. Python itself, the language, is not uh, very fast. However, you have to think of Python as an interface for many good libraries. So when you use TensorFlow, PyTorch, NumPy, Numba, these are low-level C++ compiled routines that run almost as fast or as fast as if you had written a C++ code from scratch. So when you want to do a lot of these things in Python, what you are using is in Python only as an interface language to all of those packages. If you're doing a lot of things in Python, then you're using it wrong. <laughs> you know? just, just like you can do a lot in Bash, but you only use Bash to do some things, right? So Python is basically the same, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool, thanks. Okay, great. Um, so um, we're running out of time, but I still wanted to to ask a couple questions regarding the second part of of the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, f first, a, a quick one regarding the Casa Cibarra. The, I mean, I guess that you abandoned Casa Cibarra because it was already being taken care of by 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 the by the learning, right? Uh, but was there any other reason? Because in principle, in Casa Cibarra, then you. you you don't have to care about neutrino data, uh, but what what was the, the reason that that you said okay let's let's just not not use it and let machine learning you know take care of of the neutrino so data. The, so so the motivation was as simple as this: we finished the other paper. Werner was putting his paper out in, as they put in January, and Werner said we need to try it in a very difficult example. That was it. Oh. <laughs> oh, I see, I so see. by so by giving up uh, the Kalsey Barra parameterization, we are um, just just making the problem more difficult on purpose. Okay. Yeah. So um, like like Kalsey Barra. So for example, in the in the in the Higgs in in this one, we are using an equivalent parameterization, but for the Higgs mass, which is the Dipankar's um, Dipankar's Deep, parameterization, which basically you put the low level. Uh, masses and then you have to rotate back into the uh, to the PSM per, uh, scalar per parameters, right? Uh, in this case, mm -hmm. we didn't complicate. We could have complicated it, but in this case, uh, we didn't do it. So it was just a matter of seeing if it was possible, you know, yeah. because because whereas Kazibar and Dipankar parameterizations are very, are very powerful, uh, we also want to show that Maybe in the future we will not have to look for parameterizations like that if machine learning and AI are really this efficient to find points. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Excellent. And and the, the last question uh, could you go to slide 42 where you did your scans on on the MSSM and PMSSM? So so I was um, a bit surprised when when on the on the on the right. Uh, where you have your, I don't know how you pronounce it, SMICE, it's a CMA, yes, yes. right? Uh, there are like those blobs for mm -hmm. lar very large mu uh, that are not really noticeable on the other ones. I, I don't know if 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 there is a an explanation for for those blobs. What 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 is happening there? Uh, there, there is no physical. Mountain. It's not a physical explanation. It's an algorithm explanation. So, mm. from so one thing that you'll notice is that minimizing the C function makes your problem very different from doing uh, an MCMC scan with likelihoods. And with this C function, the, the global minimum, the points in the global minimum are the same. Uh, are all the same. 
in term, uh, the way that the algorithm see, because all of them yield zero for the, for the loss function that you're trying to minimize. If you mm -hmm. were doing something like an MCMC, uh, what you call valid points would still have a non-vanishing likelihood because you have some Gaussian profile or something like that. So if you were doing an MCMC, you would have very little points in this region because the, it would not be favorable over the likelihoods. But for the CMS, for the SMIs, the points that are here, or in that blob, they are the same. They are as legitimate and uh, as as they can be because it's just the region of the parameter space that it found that minimizes the loss function. So the Gaussian of the SMIs will then spread out in that region and then eventually will restart, which is exactly what you're saying here. So basically it found a region there it spread out, found a lot of value. Concentrated on there restarted. and- Yes. Mm -hmm. I and then see. it was restarted and went elsewhere, okay? I so see. this restart, so restarting the SMIs is um, something that I'm quite focused on, not on the paper with Werner and the students, because here we are using the, um, the multi-objective approach using genetic algorithms. But for the three HDM, this is this is a SMIs variation. So here I'm trying, so you can see like, these lines of the SMIs, actually the SMIs going around a region mm -hmm. that's already valid. What I was able to do here was to motivate it to extra, to do extra exploration in the global minima. And so you can see the SMIs actually going around and finding points in the in the global yeah. minima. Okay. That's very nice. Yeah. Um, so how you get so it, so how you get these algorithms to explore because they, they tend to be very, um, the terminology in the literature is eager. They are very eager. They're very eager to find the minimum. Whereas what we want is not only to find valid points, but to find all of them, or at least to try to have the best coverage possible mm -hmm. of the parameter space, right? So yeah. I'm, now, I'm now fighting the fight of exploring the rest of the parameter space. I'm already not fighting the fight of finding valid points because those are very yeah. easy for me to find nowadays. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, super. Um, so I guess that's it. We've <laughs> run a bit of, out of time. Uh, so so uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Miguel, for for the very uh, nice uh, nice talk. And um, to all viewers, uh, please join us in a couple of weeks as we will have David Velasco uh, giving a giving a talk. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being here, and we'll see invitation. you next time. It's thank your you. role. Bye bye. Como siempre. <laughs>